the rabbit is approaching, what has the United Nations been doing over the past year and what will it be busy with in 2023? Today I have a privileged tour in the Yuan compound here in downtown Beijing by someone who is very special. Come with me. Hi, Sid. Welcome, Lucian. Welcome. Thank you. Very Thank you very welcome. much. For welcome to the United Nations. Thank you. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, this is the UN, established here in 1979, when the UN first established its presence here. And China's per capita GDP was a mere 180 US dollars. 180? 180 US wow. dollars. So and the today, the exponential rise of this Absolutely. country, where it is at about $12,500, and we expect it to be about $25,000 per capita GDP by 2025. But wow. let me give you a... The numbers are dizzying. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but uh, absolutely, the UN played a big part. The UN has been a part of this, of China's development yeah. trajectory right from the start. When China was extremely poor, we used to bring, we were a net aid provider, bring mm -hmm. ideas and resources. But I think what was transformative is the embrace of pragmatism by Chinese leadership and, and the political system that allowed this rigor and growth, which was yeah. exponential. So, you know, it is on many counts also pretty miraculous. But here is a, here is a, uh, a kaleidoscope of our former secretary generals, as you can see, and Kurt Walterheim and yeah. the Yavia Perez de Cuella, different secretary generals on this side. And then, you know, the current secretary general, of course, is um, Mr. Antonio Guterres, who was here in February last year for the Winter Olympics. And of course, prior to him, it was Mr. Bang and Kofi Annan. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, and, and, you know, all of them have been here in China, and uh, not just once, but several times. And there we have a painting, which is a painting of peace, which was established mm -hmm. uh, by a famous Chinese painter. And this is where the UN country team meets. This is where we host all our events. So this is the main conference room. And, you know, whenever we need to work remotely, we can work from here and then get people online yeah. anywhere in the world. What about the office? Shall we take a look at of your course. office? Yeah, Let's please. Go. So this is how the steps leading up to the resident coordinator's office, where mm -hmm. I have a brilliant team that I work with. But let's start here. Now, this is a collage, a mosaic of the work of the leadership of the UN country team. We all came together in a retreat in 2021. And every leader of the UN country team, of all the 26 UN agencies, came together. And everybody put yeah. one piece of this in here and this is what we've come up with is what is it what does it say it says delivering as one that means the un family is in lockstep with the un secretary general mr antonio guterres's mm -hmm. vision of a un that is fit for purpose a un which is repositioned and a un that has come together to deliver as one for china's development ambitions wow. that's what this wow. this epitomizes precisely the, the mood and the emotion and the passion of the of the leadership of the UN country. Great. And it adds a touch of art. Of course. To of your course. work. Yeah, 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 of course. We need art. We need uh, poetry. Indeed. So here we go. Well, this is the office. And as you can see, everybody has a stand-up desk here. And people like standing and working. Mm -hmm. How many staff you have we here? We have about, about 20 staff. Mostly? Uh, uh, no, uh, a few internationals, but mostly Ch Chinese nationals and a stellar team absolutely How, stellar what's the average age do you know this about? is all this is all a very young group with the exception of the rc the rest of them are really young <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you're under young. pressure <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> yeah and, i see this calligraphy yeah, and, you know this was done for the un day last year this what does a, it say well it says that this is a time which is better than all other times in a sense it kind of captures the spirit of that un day that we had that day and right. uh, you know and, and and it kind of captures also the emotion that, that took place during that event. You know, um, Foreign Minister Wang Yi actually nominated Vice Minister Ma Chao Shu to come and uh, be the chief guest, and we were very honored by his mm -hmm. presence. And this was, you know, this was the significance of that particular day. Do you know how to, how to say these words in Chinese? I, I, unfortunately not. Would you like to give it a try? Jing xi he xi. Jing xi he xi. I yeah. taught you something yeah, new. We did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> So this is my office. As you can see, this is where the UN Secretary General is. We have the 
the UN flag and the, and the Chinese, Chinese flags flag. juxtapositioned together. Yeah. But let's start from there. Because okay. this was a very important meeting that I had with Foreign Minister Wang Yi. And hmm. I was presenting him the China UN flag, this badge over here. Mm -hmm. And then we had a very productive bilateral meeting last year to kind of look at the challenges that we are facing with the pandemic, mm -hmm. with, uh, the, with the climate crisis. Did it hamper your work? I mean, the, the pandemic, the three years? Well, you know, I mean, what we did was we adapted yeah. to the new reality that you could also work remotely. And it did not bring down our efficiency. Mm. And, and what it did was it actually enhanced it in many, many ways. And, but at the same time, I think it's also given us a window in the importance of public health and yeah. why it is so crucial. Absolutely. And perhaps that's something we should be discussing after this. Yeah. Uh, that was a gift to me from the Kenyan foreign minister the time I was leaving Kenya mm -hmm. in January 2021. And it's basically a piece of art. Uh, it's a painting on cloth and, and it represents the, 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 the body of the Kenyan yeah. wildlife. Yeah. And the elephant is very much a centerpiece of that. And, you know, so it was a privilege for me to, to, to get that. It give you the memory that it's you had. It's an important memory, important yeah. memory. And Africa yeah. is very much ingrained in me because half my career was spent there. Yeah. Over there, for example, this came from the counties in Kenya mm -hmm. where they recognize my work and the attachment that we yeah. feel, you know. So um, this is from one of the governors of one of the counties and that's from the frontier counties where they say that I've been a true friend to them and in the work that we try to do to transform these places. I see something different in your office, which is your desk is very yes, high. Yes. And, and, and all of your staff have these adjustable desks. Exactly. What's the story? <laughs> so, you know, a stand-up desk, there was a study which was done yeah. uh, by, by Harvard Medical School. And, and it is said that if you stand at work for up to eight to ten hours a day... And you don't even have a chair. No, I don't have a chair. Okay, if what's you, the story? For, well, it's basically the equivalent of running ten marathons a year. You know, fitness is... Our biggest problem today is in the world mm -hmm. is sitting is the new smoking. Sitting is the new smoking. We are sitting all the time. We sit for breakfast, we yeah. sit in a car, we sit in a meeting, we sit for lunch. We sit again in a meeting, we come home, sit in a car, again get home, sit in front of the television, sit for dinner. So basically what's happening is the high levels of, of non-communicable diseases like diabetes and hypertension is because of that inactivity. And what we are trying to do is change that. So I think as the RC myself, I want to be a, a model of that. Yeah. Well, I see you have, you have a great feeling or aurora of uh, energy of activity, of positivity. Is that just standing giving to you or do you have other well, ways of, no, you know, giving, yeah. energizing yourself without uh, intaking too much vitamins or extra nutrition? So let me take this back to uh, January 2020 before the pandemic came to Kenya. I was about 80 kilos. Okay. I was nearly 80 kilos. <laughs> I was really fat. All right. And I looked at myself one day in the mirror and I was just looking at myself. I was pre-diabetic. I was on cholesterol tablets. I just didn't feel good about myself. And that's when I came across this guy called Wim Hof and I started, who does a breathing technique. Mm. And I started to practice that. And over time, it was a combination of Wim Hof breathing, which is really finding the chi in your body through breath work. And then with that, I combined that with what you call high intensity interval training, which is really, you know, push ups, pull ups, building your core up. And the third is going into a cold bath every day, a cold bath. There are no hot showers. Even, even, even in the in highest of winter, I have a cold bath. So what it does, it basically activates your it's anti inflammatory. It enhances your immune system. Let me give you one example of that. In the recent COVID surge, I did not get COVID. My son got it. The IE in our house got it. All my staff got it. I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, my, my antibody count is high. This could also be attributable to the Sinovac vaccines. But I had that vaccine, the three doses, back in 2021. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, but I'm, I just but feel that this combination is actually very helpful. And now I'm 60 kilos. And I've come to the weight where I really wanted to be. And you look great. I feel good. And you, know? you feel and good. So I do an hour of breath work in the morning. And so, I do it. And I do about 20 minutes of that at minus 12 outside. Wow. In the cold. Is it possible to do a small demonstration here? I mean, what, you know, what would it be like 
just you know, a cycle of breathing you here. Know, a, lot of, a lot of people um, think that we breathe, so what is so exceptional about the mm. breathing? Now, if you look at people who practice Tai Chi or people who practice Chinese martial arts, people who practice yoga, it's all about breath work. And that breath work, 70% of the world breathes through the mouth. Now, the mouth is where the disease goes in from. The mouth is meant for eating. Okay. The nose is meant for breathing. Have so you ever what seen would a, you do? Have you ever seen a horse running with its mouth open? No. <laughs> the, the horse uses its nose. Of course. So essentially, it's called diaphragmatic breathing. The breathing is meant to be into the stomach. This is the diaphragm. Okay. And when you breathe, it is... We take very superficial breath through our chests. And because you are breathing through the mouth, you are not taking oxygenating the body fully. Now, in the last three years that I've practiced this, I'm pretty obsessed with this breathing. I do about an hour of breath work in the morning. So four o'clock to five o'clock breathing, five o'clock to six o'clock uh, exercise. Wow. And between six and, six and seven, and that's before my son wakes up, I do a sauna and a cold bath. Oh, my goodness. Every day. Oh, my goodness. I got to start trying, but... What does that have to do with your job here, with your mission here? Besides the fact that you're energetic enough to do all the things uh, with great efficiency. You know, I think what COVID reminded us was the fragility of health systems all over the world. Mm. All over the world, without exception, this microscopic virus went and destroyed economies, you know. You know destroyed families. Destroyed families. Yeah. It just... It just so it, it reminds us how important it is to invest in public health. And there is... On an individual level. On individual level and at a national level, okay. at every level. So when we are talking about the sustainable development goal number three, in fact, I feel today it is the very anchor around which the rest of the SDGs will now thrive and survive. Simply because what, if you recall, uh, Herophilus was a Greek philosopher mm. who in 300 BC said, he said, and I quote him, when health is absent, yeah, there's nothing. Wisdom cannot reveal itself. Art cannot manifest. Seriously. Strength cannot fight. Yeah. Wealth becomes useless and intelligence cannot be applied. That's the end of the quote. So in a sense, it captured what this gentleman said 300, in 300 BC, so relevant to us today. I believe that from an individual level, when we make that effort, within the families, we make that effort of improving our health system, our health outcomes, we tend to be better prepared to face off other diseases. So it's clear how just a single pandemic has brought so many millions of people back into poverty mm -hmm. simply because they got out of jobs, you know, their, their uh, income yeah. started to fall, many people got unemployed, yeah. you know, so it created so many things. So it's, it's a reminder how important it is. And, and I worry about China for one thing, is that the levels of diabetes is rising in China. So you diabetes. want to set an example? I want, you want to, to make sit? sure that we are, we are successful with the Healthy China 2030 yeah. initiative. That's the vision that yeah. President Xi Jinping has and you want to of a China which is, which is healthy. Now, if the UN is going to be a partner with the government, we at an individual level and collectively must be part of that system that energizes the, the communities around us, our friends around us, and our programs around us to give velocity to that ambition that President Xi has, that we will have a healthy China by 2030. But yeah. that needs an investment. That needs an individual investment, but that also needs a national investment. Great. Okay, I have to start taking coach showers then. Oh, yes. <laughs> and uh, eat less. And, oh, yes. And that's the other thing. I do eat less. So mm -hmm. uh, I eat one meal a day. Every 24 oh, hours, I eat just one. <laughs> And, actually, and you're not is, hungry. And that has done me a load of good because, you know, when you eat less, <clears throat> you, you know, your liver then starts not having to produce so much of insulin to keep breaking down food. Yeah. And so it's constantly getting a break. And the human body was not meant to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner and, you know, keep going in that cycle. <laughs> great, great. OK, I mean, definitely, I think that awareness is absolutely important. Absolutely crucial. Yeah. So, Sid, um, we've talked a lot, but uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the important proposals China has put forward uh, in collaboration with the UN to help achieve the sustainable goals, for instance, the Global Development Initiative. So, uh, going into 2023, how do you expect the UN system uh, to work as a whole to advance the implementation 
or in collaboration with this initiative in, in 2023? Well, first of all, the United Nations welcomes any initiative by any member state in the world that brings forth more momentum, more progress towards achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. I think what the pandemic did was it reversed a lot of the gains globally. Mm -hmm. What we need is new energy, new velocity, new momentum to get the SDGs going. So, you know, the Secretary General, my boss, Mr. Antonio Guterres, has been very clear. When he met with President Xi Jinping he, he, uh, in February last year, and I was at the meeting with him during the Winter Olympics, he, he thanked the President's initiative and, and, and emphasized that the UN will work and provide its best technical capacity to make sure that the GDI, or the Global Development Initiative, right. is fully aligned to global norms and standards and is aligned to the purposes for the fulfillment of the Sustainable Development Goals. And this has already found a lot of traction amongst many, many member states um, across the world. So, so be anything that does, that gives a, a achievement of the SDGs, if it can happen, we welcome that. So in many ways, I see that collaboration going forward. But particularly in 2023, we already have a cooperation framework with China, which is the United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, which is from 2021 to 2025. Mm -hmm. 2023 is the midpoint. So yeah. my intention is to make sure what you saw that delivering is one, is we ramp up the delivery mechanisms to make sure that we not only achieve what is the outcomes of the SDGs, but in the midpoint, what we will do with the foreign ministry and the MOFCOM ministry is to look at are there any corrections that we need to make as we go towards 2025, which will be the end point of the of the so specifically framework. specifically what will be your priorities for 2023? Some of the main activities, for instance, you'll be hosting. So essentially, the cooperation framework is on three strategic pillars people and prosperity. We need to make sure that the people continue. Rural revitalization is a part of that, making sure that we reach the furthest behind, making sure we leave no one behind. So that is number one. Number two is the planet, and that's the climate. And on this, I just want to commend China and the US having come together at the COP27 and started the discussion, which was very critical. I actually wrote about it and op-ed about it in CNBC. And I did an interview with, with Phoenix TV on the importance of China and the U.S. coming together to safeguard the planet because they will save the world then mm. and, and ensure that a low carbon economic growth can happen across the world. And the third area is partnerships. And partnerships is going to be crucial. And therefore, what the UN is doing is we want to take China's knowledge of the experience it has gained over the last 44 years that we worked with the UN, yeah. which has gone from a poor country with a per, per capita GDP of $180 to today an upper middle income country, what are those experiences we can share with the global south, with other countries struggling with poverty too? Yeah. Well, this is a very important period of time, mm -hmm. a transformation yep. that China has gone through with the help, of course, of international partners such as the United Nations. How has China's role changed within the UN as a partner of the UN? What is your observation of the kind of relationship at this stage now? China is a very significant partner of the United Nations. It is a very significant player in the space of multilateralism. It is a very significant partner in G77. And above all that, it is today the second largest contributor to the United Nations budget, both for the regular budget and the peacekeeping budget, and has also deployed uh, excellent uh, peacekeeping troops in many, many conflict-affected parts of the world. So on, on multiple counts, China is doing a splendid job in terms of supporting the United Nations, in terms of the way we are also working together, not just nationally in China, mm -hmm. but globally. And I want to take this opportunity to commend and thank the government of, of China uh, for, the, for the strong partnership and the strong support they give to the United Nations and to me as the resident coordinator. And I consider it a privilege to be the UN resident coordinator here in China. Well, some people say China is exerting influence in the UN to, quote unquote, legitimize and disseminate its foreign policy values and interests. Do you, ha do you have any concern on that front uh, about China's growing presence or assertiveness in the words of some people who are very skeptical of China's peaceful intentions? Well, you know, I mean, people may have different opinions, but, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the that China is a very important and crucial member of the United Nations. It is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. And today, 
you know, we need a world of peace. We need much more. That is what the Secretary General's message is. And we see China playing a very important role in enhancing and making sure that we have a much more peaceful world. And we make sure that we are able to kind of diffuse these different tensions and conflicts that we are seeing. Because ultimately, what do people aspire for? They want to aspire for a better quality of life. They aspire for, you know, better opportunities, right. more health, more education, more access to clean water. Those are the basic issues that the world is currently struggling with. So we we'll need less tensions, more collaboration, you know, less confrontation, more cooperation, more, I mean, you know, more dialogue and much more diplomacy. And I feel that these are avenues which are still there. And I, that is why, you know, it is the year of the rabbit. Yeah. And, it is a, it, and it demonstrates vitality, it demonstrates, uh, you know, energy, it demonstrates dexterity. This is that moment for us to push. I feel very optimistic for the year 2023. I think the opening up of China is a very welcome move. And that gives the opportunity for really not just China's own growth, but the growth of China impacts global growth too. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about this year. You may be very optimistic, I'm op optimistic too, but the realities can be very harsh. Um, we do have a lot of problems and, and one of them is the growing competition some countries are seeing uh, in China. Do you have any concerns about you know this kind of environment or do you see any challenges for your work going ahead in, in the next year, for instance? And, and how do you plan to encounter that? Frankly, Lucian, I don't see it as a challenge. I see it as an opportunity. I see the UN playing its real role of being a connector, being a, co a, a coordinator, being a catalyzer of, of initiatives, which is what we are doing. I see great opportunities for public-private partnerships to come together, not only to support China's own ambition on its 14 mm. five-year plan, but what we can do together to kind of change and lift people out of out of poverty in the rest of the world because 2030 is just around the corner it is the decade of action for the achievement yeah. of the sustainable development goals and as the deputy secretary general amina muhammad constantly reminds us that we have to flip the orthodoxy we can't just do business as usual i see enormous opportunities there and let me tell you in the last two years that is why i i, I took that opportunity to state up front about the cooperation we have received from the government of china I believe not just globally, but at the national level, we would be able to convene, converge and catalyze these, these initiatives for advancing development, for advancing growth, for advancing more South-South cooperation and learning, but above all, for advancing humanity. That's, you know, that's um, absolutely, you know, I think that's, that captures, captures the, our wish as we're well going forward. Um, just on the last note, you were posted here um, two years ago and you saw this country up front. You were immersed in, in the people, in the life. What has changed about the perception of China in you, if any? And what would you tell the people who may not have the privilege to live here, to see every part of society, to talk to everybody on the street? What is that one thing that you want to share with them about China? You know, the most crucial thing that China achieved by lifting nearly 800 million people out of abject poverty was to give people dignity. And I think dignity at the, is at the root of everything. When that dignity comes from a feeling of self-respect, and that self-respect comes from not being given handouts or aid, but really developing their economic growth. And when I see the economic miracle of China, it reminds me that if China can do it with a population of 1.4 billion people, every other country can do it. It's a matter of, I would say, the three Ps. Number one, political will. Very strong political mm -hmm. will. Right since the time the opening up and the reforms that took place in the late 70s, mm -hmm. it was maintained. The second is the right public policies. Public policies are crucial at the national level, but down to the, uh, into the county. I've been to counties like Deqing, you know, which was a poor, mufasal place. And today it's probably one of the best Airbnb spots. It's, it's got yeah. a national geographic adventure center. I mean, it's just fascinating to see how these rural parts are transformed. When I go to Shenzhen, I mean, a small fishing village. And today it's like the Silicon Valley of the East. It's just quite, quite amazing. 
about the creativity, about the growth, about the technology, about the innovation that has happened here. That to me is the most striking, that with this population size, to be able to achieve, to become food secure, to have that level of dignity, to, to make sure that growth was sustained throughout and not just at a few places. So it did not, you know, it, the, the inequality index constantly is reduced and which is what the 14 five year plan is trying to do. I think these are important initiatives because that is what will help us achieve the sustainable development goals in China and the partnerships. The third oh. and the most important one yeah. is partnerships. So the third P, without partnerships, the public private sector, the, the partnerships between the UN, the government, the private sector, civil society, mm. all it has to be an all of society approach. That was the third thing that China did, was to bring the best partnerships together in order to impact that rural revitalization that we talk about. Yeah. So those are the three fields. Any room for improvement? Well, that is why that is why there is a 14 five year plan. This is precisely why that room for improvement is there. That is why we have a UN cooperation framework with China yeah. is to advance the development trajectory. Ultimately, what is our aim? The SDGs. The SDGs is the North Star. We are all working towards achievement of the 2030 agenda and we have less than eight years now for it. Thank you so much, Siddharth Chatterjee, the UN resident coordinator here in China. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really a pleasure. Thank you.